Thanks for coming out on this dark and rainy night. <laughs> it's really nice to get away from Coburg for a little while and come to Ballarat. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Warawarang and Jajawarang people and um, their elders past, present and emerging and thank them for their ancient and abiding storytelling tradition. On Kulin land where I assembled this presentation, it's the ghouling or orchid season and it's just finishing and we're now entering the poor neat or tadpole season and the Merry Creek is running high with all the rain we've had recently. As you can probably guess from my accent, I'm originally from Aotearoa, New Zealand and for a number of years I've been very preoccupied with literary relics. This could partly be because my own father was a novelist whose house is now in the process of being turned into a writer's centre in West Auckland, so this partly uh, explains my obsession. Today I'd like to offer a quick guided tour which takes in a handful of items associated with Lawson, but certainly not all of them. I'm actually not talking about the suit, unfortunately, but um, we can maybe talk about that afterwards. Uh, my book, Locating Australian Literary Memory, looked at places and sites associated with 11 Australian authors, including Lawson, but I wasn't able to dedicate much time or space to objects. And uh, so this is an opportunity for me to talk a bit more about objects. Many of the artefacts connected with authors tend to be displayed in literary houses, but Lawson doesn't have a house except for the Lawson Centre in Golgong, which is in an old Salvation Army hall. It wasn't a former residence, but it is in the same region as his childhood home. This means it takes an extra effort to locate all of the items, if, if you have a will to do so. Um, and, and I should say that the Centre in Golgong does an excellent job and has great guides and uh, they have a lot of facsimiles or copies of objects, like the old flower bin uh, that was from Lawson's family, I believe. Uh, so I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with Lawson, but uh, I'll just give a very brief outline of his biography, uh, because it does obviously intersect with some of the odd objects um, from his life. He was born on the goldfields at Grenfell in New South Wales on the 17th of June, 1867. His father was Nils Hertzberg Larsen, who was a Norwegian sailor who had a property at Pipe Clay near Mudgee. His mother, Louisa Lawson, had an interest in republicanism and women's civil rights and is known for her publication, The Dawn. Henry spent his early years at the property at Pipe Clay. His father was often away trying to earn enough money for the family as a carpenter. And I know that Henry worked with him as a carpenter some of the time. He only had three years of schooling at the Pipe Clay school that his mother agitated for, along with other parents from the area. His father was often away um, trying to earn money, as I said, uh, and he often joined him. Uh, when he left school at 13, he began an apprenticeship as a coach painter, and his parents separated when he was 15, and he eventually went to live with his mother, brother and sister in Sydney. Uh, and that's a, a drawing done by Will Lawson, uh, who actually ended up with uh, Henry's wife later in life. Um, he did that drawing of um, the school in Yurundari that Henry attended for three years or so. His first published prose was in The Republican in 1887, and his first published poem was A Song of the Republic, which appeared in the Bulletin in the same year. His mother published the magazine Dawn, and um, as I said, and he published a poem in that and helped with with the day-to-day -day operations. He did various work to make a living, including painting houses in Albury, Western Australia, and Burke, New South Wales, and he worked on magazines like The Boomerang, The Worker, and he submitted items to The Bulletin, The Truth, and The Sydney Worker. 
He taught in a Māori school in Aotearoa, New Zealand, which he wrote about, and spent time in London. He married Bertha Brait, a nurse from Bensdale, Victoria, and she was the stepdaughter of the owner of a Sydney bookshop frequented by Henry and other writers and poets of the time. Henry and Bertha had a son and daughter before separating in 1902. Lawson moved all around Australia. As we know, or many of you would know, uh, sadly he was a chronic alcoholic and was very often ill and in trouble with the law, usually for not paying child support or for being drunk in public. He had friends who supported him and tried to help him abstain, but it never worked for very long. He died at Abbotsford, New South Wales on the 2nd of September 1922 after suffering his second cerebral haemorrhage at 54 years old. And as you may know, tomorrow is the 100 year anniversary of his, of his death. He was given a state funeral two days after his death and this was the first non-official, he was the first non-official and author to be granted a state funeral, so it was a really big deal. And I believe that was partly due to Jack Lang's support for it, who had quite a bit of um, influence at that time. In 1923, the Henry Lawson Memorial and Literary Society was established by Steve Ford at Footscray in Victoria. And the Henry Lawson Centre at Golgong uh, was also started, um, I'm not sure of the date of that, but it has been perpetuating Lawson's memory ever since. What this biography doesn't tell you is that Lawson can be a rather polarising figure who prompts divergent views about his legacy, or legacies plural. As Lucy Sussex has observed, Lawson is a national icon and his history is a contested space Lawson having his partisans. Whatever your view of him as a writer and a human being, the preservation of his objects indicates a certain concern to memorialise him into the future. You might well ask, why do the relics of an author matter? And why have people gone to great lengths to collect them? There are lots of examples of people fulfilling this duty to posterity in Australian literary history, including Kate Baker, who took care of Joseph Furphy's literary afterlife. As you'll hear, Mary Gilmore, or Dame Mary Gilmore, did something similar for many of Lawson's objects. So where does this interest in author's relics come from? I've spoken of my interest, but there's also a broader interest in these relics. Of course, Settler Australia inherited a long history of antiquarianism from Britain. British colonisation began in 1788 at a high point for literary fetishism, particularly of writers' houses and the objects associated with them. Before the 16th century, the only things that tended to be collected were religious relics, fragments of bone, hair, garments, desiccated fingers of saints, and even Jesus' foreskin, and I believe there are many of those scattered around Europe. How could there be so many? <laughs> and lots of pilgrims went to see things like that. The Renaissance gave birth to antiquarianism. Relics from antiqu antiquity became the new devotional objects. As Robin Anir notes, objects began to be valued for their connection to ancient civilizations, not just for their age. In her new book, Time's Witness, Rosemary Hill traces the origins of English antiquarianism to the Reformation because this was the point from which the antiquaries of the Romantic period traced their intellectual descent. They saw it as the determining event in British history. With the Reformation, a thousand years of history was shut off and largely destroyed, leaving a landscape spattered with ruins, which they felt duty-bound to preserve or eulogise, or both. And reading this book, I realised what a dangerous pursuit it was to be an antiquarian um, at certain points in history. They were often seen as crackpots who were driven to protect everything old, but they were later valued for the cultural preservation they undertook, often against great resistance. Nicola Watson, who has written a new book called The Author's Effects, 
observes that the desire to memorialise dead writers became more evident around the end of the 18th century. This trend was exemplified by the school of graveyard writing and the acceleration of commemorative practices, both private and public. Arguably, investment in writers' objects and sim simulacra of their body parts, like uh, moulds and casts and so on, are intertwined with the cult of genius that was emerging then. So rather than having a cult revolving around a saint, um, people started to be um, fetishising authors, and these things could coexist, of course. In the late 18th century, it narratives that told stories from the point of view of an object were very popular, and this is an example of one uh, which is about a silver penny and its life with its human uh, companions. It narratives are pieces of fiction in which non-human protagonists tell their own story. Um, and sometimes the story is used as an axis or hub around which other stories are spun. Examples of such non-humans include air balloons, clothes, coaches, coins, corkscrews, pin cushions, and various animals. Its narratives are imaginatively told lives of these objects alongside their owners who might well be well known or they might just be ordinary people or children. Not saying children are ordinary people, but <laughs> sometimes they are famous people and they are objects associated with them. As Elaine Fried, Friedgood argues, object narrators enact a form of omniscience unavailable to human narrators because objects are with people all the time, uh, usually. They overhear the innermost thoughts of their owners and they have intimate access to their humans, often being handled or used on a daily basis in a domestic environment. For this reason, items formerly belonging to famous people have a certain allure. If they touch or view the object, people feel they are somehow co connecting with the celebrity they admire, and this can extend to authors. Even objects that never knew their owners while they were alive, but, but which have some relation to their death, are also imbued with a so certain erratic power, Friedgood argues. And it's interesting that there are a lot of um, forms of popular culture now, like podcasts that uh, talk about the lives of objects. Um, there's a US-based one called Everything is Alive, uh, which uh, prompts listeners to think about life from different positions. Um, there's one about a subway seat, a grain of sand, a balloon, a jack-o'-lantern, and so on. And there's also others that um, tell the history of the world um, through a hundred objects, like one through the BBC. So antiquarians uh, have not always been valued in Australia. Um, and I've mentioned that they weren't always that popular in Europe and particularly in Britain. Uh, and they also have had a mixed reception here. Tom Griffith, Griffiths notes that the enduring image of the antiquarian in Australia is eccentric. Um, so they're seen as preserving the relics of the past for their own sake. He cites Graham Davison, who says that the antiquarian possesses, quote, the particularizing mind of the collector, the preservationist, the restorer, Antiquarian history seeks not to transcend the past, but to preserve it, to re-enter it, and if necessary, to recreate it. Often the work of antiquarians is regarded as being contrary to scholarly pursuits, especially since scholarship was professionalised. When these pursuits don't really need to be in conflict, um, they can be complementary. That's what I think anyway. The Australian-based Dawn and Dusk Club was a literary group which included among its objectives the aim to establish a society for the erection of ancient ruins in Australia. Ignoring the fact that there are already many of these ruins after the gold rushes. It was founded in the 1890s by Bertram Stevens, Jim Philp, Frank Marnie, uh, Victor Daly, and Con Lindsay, and it was named after Daly's book, At Dawn and Dusk, which came out in 1898. 
The spirit was light-hearted, very masculine. I don't think there are any feminine members. Um, undoubtedly reliant on al alcohol for its bonhomie. J.F. Archibald of the Bulletin was the leading spirit in a group which succeeded the Dawn and Dusk Club called um, the Supper Club. And in an article I found called Old Sydney and in the New Mercury newspaper, it says that the Dawn and Dusk Club was a remarkable fraternity which possessed not only temporal members such as Henry Lawson and Victor Daly, but spiritual ones as well including Shakespeare, Rabelais and Aristophanes. Virgil and Milton had been blackballed on account of their lack of humour. These two assemblages of literary personalities indicated an interest in preserving or fabricating, even, a literary past complete with romantic ruins. And we might point to Lawson's childhood home as, a, as an example, um, the one in Eurandere is an example of a romantic ruin, and there's a lot of um, support uh, behind protecting that, but unfortunately it was, it was left to go to ruins and it was not able to be saved. Lawson himself was very interested in things from the past, and it's interesting to think about how he might regard the preservation of his personal effects if he came back, and Philip Edmonds actually does imagine this in his book uh, leaving home with Henry when and Henry comes out of an archive as a researcher is there to look at his all his effects and he, he demands to be taken on a road trip and he's driven around Australia and he's amazed at all the commemorations in his name. I tried to count them a while ago and I got up to about 18 but I'm not sure if that's completely correct because they do fluctuate but there's many places named after him and objects like barbecues. <laughs> uh, as Tom Griffiths writes in his book, Hunters and Collectors, The Antiquarian Imagination in Australia, Lawson was moved by old towns in which he found a painful sense of listening. Griffiths notes that he was moved by them by their air of former greatness and their accidental preservation of a decaying but poignant yesterday. He wrote of Tubu Burra, Hill End, Wentworth, Will Kenya, these remnants of the past. He asked, can we ever bring them back to life or link them with the present? These are towns and localities rather than objects, but his poetry contains traces of nostalgia from, for objects from his past, like the old flower bin made by his father, which I mentioned earlier. Given that he was impoverished, and looked after in the last couple of years of his life by Mrs. Byers in Abbotsford. Lawson didn't leave a house, a house behind, which could be preserved. And um, apparently he was trying to make a new start in the small cottage at Abbotsford where he'd hoped to be, quote, very happy in the quiet among the few trees and flowers. In an article in the Port Perry Recorder, uh, it said that he'd put down a patch of oil cloth and was making an effort to find some tapestry and curtains to cover the windows in what he called his own study. It turned out to be the place that he died dis despite these efforts to beautify the house and make himself at home. After an author's death, there's a dangerous interval during which precious papers may be destroyed and objects may be given away or disposed of. Kevin Hetherington has written about the importance of the disposal of objects and other matter. He argues that disposal is a crucial part of the cycle of consumption that hasn't been given enough attention. Almost all acts of disposal, he argues, give new order to material things and involve repositioning them within an already known regime of possibility. In the case of Lawson's items, which were dispersed after death, rather than being thrown out, most were treated as relics, since that's a socially understood practice, because it has this long history, going back at least 200 years. So as far as we know, people didn't keep using the items that they were given after death, um, and they, they kept them for posterity. And here we have... Uh, 
a, um, a little sample of his will um, and it explains at least partly what he wanted to happen after his death. Hetherington encourage us, encourages us to see disposal as a door which is manned by door people who usher matter through and send it in particular directions. There are literary standard bearers or enthusiasts who are often there at key moments uh, or after these key moments to take possession of treasured items. This could be friends, family members, admirers from literary societies or people involved with publishing the author's work as with the so-called Boys of the Bulletin who did a lot for Lawson. Sometimes this doesn't happen, of course, and valuable items are lost forever. It really depends on the author's circumstances. The approximate time of disposal of Lawson's remaining things was early September 1922. Due to interest in Lawson's afterlife, there are a number of newspaper articles covering the will and the distribution of his few possessions, which I find remarkable, actually, how much it was publicised. Um, and this is one example of an article that talks about the mementos that are passed on. This one says that um, Lawson possessed a walking stick which seemed part and parcel of his existence. The stout piece of wood accompanied its owner on all his many perambulations and he announced his presence by tapping door, window or floor. The stick, a present from J.R. Tyrrell some three years ago, is to repose together with the pencil which Lawson last used in the Mitchell Library. A pipe is to be the property of uh, Mr. Much, and Lawson's last used pen will mark his association on the worker with Joe Noonan. A tin matchbox goes to George Robertson of Angus and Robertson, two packets of tobacco to fellow poet Roderick Quinn, two pencils to nephew Jack O'Connor, a necktie and collar stud to Jim Tyrrell, the poet's publisher, and a pair of spectacles to Phil Harris of the Aussie, who was the first friend to reach Lawson on his deathbed. An article in the Daily Mail from Brisbane with the headline, The Late Henry Lawson, Disposition of Personal Relics, repeats material from the Sunday Times piece and is also explicit about the nature of the items. They are named as relics. This indicates that they had a special aura once he'd died, but may have been regarded as ordinary items, possibly beneath, it beneath notice beforehand, maybe with the exception of his pens, which were probably seen as, as uh, holy even before death. As I've said, his lack of a permanent secure home could explain the desire to collect objects related to his life and perhaps also a factor in the drive to name streets and parks and the barbecue I mentioned after him. As Nicola Watson observes, houses associated with the writer provide a fitting habitation for the individual and collective imagination. In the absence of any remaining houses, dispersed objects may take on a weightier significance. Watson argues that admiring tourists viewing, viewing the relics of authors effectively rescues them from death, so the viewing keeps them alive. However, most Lawson items are not viewed by tourists, except for the copies at the Lawson Centre. But I do agree with Watson that it's the viewer who activates the relic through their scrutiny and subsequent storytelling. So how do we judge what a relic might be worth to posterity? The value of a literary relic increases if it can be identified as having a parallel existence within that author's life alongside their human biography. At the extreme, such relics are felt to have the power to conjure and make manifest the author and their spirit. Watson argues that various objects that point metonymically to the absent body of the author, bodily remains, preserved pets, clothes, chairs, writing desks and household objects uh, are, are very special for viewers. The power of the literary relic, Watson argues, resides in the object's admonitory materiality, but all the same might best be described as super-material, 
and its ability to raise the ghost of the author. And some people believe they can connect with the ghost of the author through these objects. Now to turn to the actual objects, I'm going to do, start the tour now uh, with my favourite one, which is the tobacco packet. I'm not sure how many people have seen this one. Um, and it's one of two that were given to Roderick Quinn, and I think the other one might have been smoked, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> um, as I've already mentioned, Lawson was on a downward trajectory in the later part of his life and he lived largely on handouts from friends and benefited from the charity of Mrs. Byers, who fed and sheltered him. And given his constant need for alcohol, he'd often sell items like walking sticks and even boots in return for beer money. These objects may have been used up and thrown away had they not been connected with him. In themselves, they were nothing special, cheap and shabby, shabby even, but his ownership bestowed an aura. As the framework of value changes, objects are viewed differently. Lawson's tobacco packet is a case in point. When did it cross over from being junk to being a relic? Who thought to keep such an item? A decision to keep items which might seem like rubbish to others shows that there are emotional connections at play in this kind of decision making. The Will's Vice Regal Tobacco in its blue packet is very distinctive, as you can see. It's been scrunched up, perhaps in a jacket pocket, and the tobacco is spilled out. The silver lining from the inside of the packet is visible on the outside. Given that tobacco is not a perishable commodity in the same way as food, it can last quite a long time under the right conditions. It still seems to be intact, but it would definitely be stale by now, I believe. And um, it was given to Roderick Quinn and presented uh, in this envelope to, to the library. And Roderick Quinn was another impoverished poet who may have smoked one of the packets. And I'm impressed by the way this is seem seemingly, the packet itself has seemingly been left as is, not neatened up too much. It's also a transient commodity which has been unnaturally frozen in one stage of its existence rather than being con consumed and thrown away. And it did make me think of Dylan Thomas's desk, which I've seen images of, I haven't been there myself, um, and the way in which um, his desk has been recreated and uh, they make it look as it might have looked. It's a mess of crumpled papers, bottles and coffee cups. Uh, and Dylan Thomas's life did overlap slightly with Lawson's, of course, but he was younger. Um, and uh, this is um, inside uh, a boathouse, they call it, in Lachan, Loghan, I think you say. And um, this was the last place that he was before he went to New York. He made a fateful journey to New York, uh, where he died in 1953, aged only 39 an early death that helped to turn his talent into a legend. So while the boathouse where this um, writing room is located uh, was not the site of his death, it was the last place he lived in his homeland before going overseas. And I, I just made a bit of a tangential connection between the tobacco packet and Dylan Thomas's desk. Um, the next item I wanted to think about um, in relation to Lawson is his walking stick. So a number of wa walking sticks still survive, possibly due to this tendency to, to trade them or give them away. The State Library of Victoria contains far less Lawsonia than its New South Wales counterpart, but it does contain a shirt, walking stick and hand casts, which I've looked at. In mid-2003, the State Library formally acquired the walking stick and the shirt which had been in the care of the Henry Lawson Memorial and Literary Society for many years. Their late secretary, Brian Callagher, was a custodian, and it was one of his last wishes that the stick and shirt be added to the existing archive of material related to the society held in the State Library's Australian Manuscripts Collection. And the walking stick contains, uh, or it bears this inscription, um, you can see it, around the outside. Um, this walking stick was used by Henry Lawson at Leeton, camping on the Murrumbidgee with his mate, 
Jim Graham, whose original name was Gordon, given by the latter to Ted Turner, from whom I obtained it, signed Harry H. Pierce. Pierce was a former president of the Henry Lawson Society. The connections between people are very interesting for me as I get older, how a thing gets transferred from one person to another. It either ends up in the bin or it's given to a museum or library for safekeeping. Or I guess there is other options like being lost in someone's basement for a very long time. That sometimes happens. Um, as you may know, Lawson spent time in Leeton in um, 1916, a dry community in southern New, New South Wales, to remove him from temptation. Chris Lee notes that friends active within the state government commissioned him to promote the new irrigation scheme, and this was one of the first official attempts to connect his reputation with a government initiative. He felt strongly about the need to irrigate parched areas of Australia, having explored them on foot as on his Burke to Hungerford tramp. Now onto the hat, the famous hat. One of Lawson's most characteristic personal effects is this hat. An article in The Sun from February 1951 notes, yesterday Dame Mary Gilmore gave the hat to the Australian Journalists Association, which will keep it as a relic of Australian literary history. When Lawson died, Mrs Byers sent the hat to Gilmore, who gave it to Jim Graham, Lawson's close friend and biographer. When Graham died, his widow asked Gilmore to give it to someone who'd take care of it. When Gilmore first saw the hat, the band was stuffed with full scat pages of Lawson's writing to make it smaller. These pages have now disappeared. This detail indicates that the hat wasn't quite the right size for Lawson's fine head, which was carefully studied by the artists Lambert and Illingworth and others to make their um, commemorations. Makes you wonder whether he actually walked around with pages of writing stuffed into this ill-fitting hat. And it must be one of a number of hats. I can't quite believe that it was the only one, and I'm sure there are more. The fact that the hat was given to Jim Graham first draws attention to a common practice when a biography is being written. The biographer becomes the contact point for people who have literary paraphernalia, but they don't always have the means to store it or offer access to a wider public. Graham may have found it useful to commune with Lawson's paraphernalia while writing the biography, which was never published, I believe, but he did write a memorial poem for his mate, The Bush Mourns. As I said, Mary Gilmore played a part in the retrieval of the hat. She was an established writer and friend of Lawson, rumoured to be a love interest at one time, but I'm not sure about that. However, Chris Lee, who wrote The City Bushman about Henry Lawson, describes Mary Gilmore as an unreliable witness when it comes to authenticating items. The library record notes that the hat is machine-stitched, made of grey wool felt and adorned around the circumference with wide, dark, grey-black Petersham ribbon with a bow at one side, faded black Petersham ribbon trim on the outer edge of, of the brim, and brown leather sweat, a brown leather sweatband inside. A brown cloth manufacturer's label is sewn to the underside of the hat on the crown. Moth holes are evident on the hat, indicating its age and possibly poor treatment before institutionalisation. Sounds like a person. <laughs> Printed in gold lettering on the band inside of the hat is F.J. Palmer & Sons Limited, Sydney was presented by Miss Joyce Dowling-Smith in December 1975. A note authenticating the ownership of this hat, written by Mary Gilmore, is on record. It states that the hat was given to Gilmore by Mrs Byers, and in the 1940s, Gilmore gave the hat to Miss Smith's stepfather, Mr Tal Ordell, and from there it was donated to the library. So it passed through many hands. And this was just after death. It may have passed through a few hands before that. Uh, the next one, which is also related to Gilmore, is the watch. And apologies for that poor quality image. It's from an old um, article from Trove. Gilmore did leave, a, uh, did uh, give the library a lot of items and did a lot of work behind the scenes to rest items that had gone 
into private ownership to wrest them back and to send them to institutions. She intervened again to gain possession of Lawson's watch. The watch has a silver catch, which 20 years or more ago had a resting place in the poet's pocket. Um, an article about it says, um, that article, Lawson's watch, another link in friendship. And once again, it's called a, a relic. Uh, Lawson, in his perpetual hard up state, had left it with Charles Frederick Borton, who sold it to Gilmore. Lawson's name is inscribed on the back and his initials are on the front of the case. Nevertheless, Gilmore managed to create a personal archive of objects and give them to the library for professional curation. And I spotted the watch in a few photos that I saw of a Lawson exhibition, so I know that it's still in circulation. This image I only managed to get today, actually, it's of a shirt that I saw in, in the State Library of Victoria collection. And you can't easily find this image online, um, but it's quite a beautiful um, image, even though it's um, quite discoloured. And this was one of half a dozen shirts given um, of Henry Lawson's, uh, given by Dan Green. Uh, given to Henry Lawson by Dan Green, apologies, so he was a kind of benefactor. He put Lawson's name down at his own dentist, optician, and at times with his tailor, so he gave him services, paid for services to keep him going. Again and again, Dan Green clad him from hat to shoes. These shirts were part of one of these clothings. They were the last of those that he wore. And once again, <laughs> Mary Gilmore, um, was the person who passed these shirts on. The role of Dan Green as benefactor is interesting too, showing that although his writing was poorly remunerated and his addiction drained a lot of his money, he was propped up by many acts of kindness. Now onto the quite spooky death mask. So um, casts have, have long been taken from living and dead personages but death masks seem very common with writers of a certain stature. And this could be because their reputation becomes cemented posthumously, excuse the pun. Life masks uh, were usually used as an aid to producing a portrait later, so as a sort of process towards the portrait. Making both life and death masks involves taking a matrix of the face and pouring plaster into the resulting mould converting a negative into a positive. Many copies can be made in this way. Lawson's mask serves to record and dramatise his death. These items almost feel too intimate, given that they are made directly from Lawson's dead body. So we have the mask, but then there's also hand casts as well, which also feel very intimate. Marcia Poynton has argued that the death mask separates the memory of the dead person from the corpse itself, preserving memory from impending decay and enshrining it within an enduring structure. Nelson Illingworth's death mask of Lawson was later used by artist George Washington Lambert, who was given the commission to produce a memorial statue. His wife, or former wife, Bertha, said that the sculptor used both her children as models. Jim provided the hair, hands and ears, and Bertha, Jr., contributed the neck and lower half of the face. His old suit was also worn by Jim and examined by the artist to get the drapery right. Lawson's death mask actually reminds me of Robbie Burns's skull, which is on display um, in Alloway. Um, and this is presented as both a cast but also as a hologram. The cast was obtained after his body had been exhumed for the second time. The first exhumation resulted from a change in Burns' status from a local writer to a national genius. When his wife died in 1834, there was another opportunity um, to take a cast of his skull because they were opening up the, the crypt, the tomb. Um, and, and there's a lot of information about that actually. Apparently they took it away and the people who were handling it tried hats on it and did all kinds of things with it. And then it was reburied in a lead casket. This exhumation was apparently driven by scientific curiosity and generated a number of copies. 
So they wanted to know what a genius's head looked like, basically. Um, at the Burns Birthplace Museum in Alloway, there's an opaque mir mirrored cabinet where you press a button which lights up the interior, revealing a life-size, full-color, 3D forensic reconstruction of Robert Burns' head. Nearby, there's another cabinet containing a cast of the poet's skull. In 2013, this was used as the basis for a full reconstruction of his head and upper body, which looks kind of creepy, I think. <laughs> but, you know, does give a sense of what he looked like. And uh, I think they use portraits uh, to inform that because there's a lot more than the skull involved in making a person. Uh, so onto the, the bronze hand cast. Nelson Illingworth's cast of Lawson's writing hand, like his face mask, is thought to have been made after death. Chris Lee notes that some reports suggest both were produced earlier in Lawson's life when the sculptor was modelling a bust. Lawson is reputed to have sold his own skeleton to Dan Angus for beer money, he says, but I don't know if that's true. The State Library of New South Wales lists this as a gilded plaster cast, bronze coloured, of his right hand on a rectangular shaped base that is hollow on the underside and has a metal semicircular hook below the wrist. A newspaper cutting from the Sunday Guardian dated 16th of August 1931, provides a different account of the creation and history of the casts and states that six copies of Henry Lawson's hand were made, one of which was broken. The donor of the, the cast, Mrs Holborn, was a friend of Ruby Illingworth, the sculptor's daughter. The underside of the cast bears remnants of paper with text in blue ink that is difficult to decipher. The library has yet another plaster cast of his hand. It's believed that Lambert took this cast or impression from a mould of Lawson's hand, which was in the possession of Mrs. Dorothy Ellesmere Paul um, from 1929 to 1930, long after his death. So, you know, he died in 1922, so this is seven years later. So the cast, uh, cast making continued for quite a while, mostly in aid of further memorials. So there's immediate cast making and then other casts made later. So these probably, um, I think, the most valuable items associated with him, but I'm not a valuer. But in terms of literary heritage, um, authors writing instruments like pens and typewriters and now laptops and desktop computers have a high rating on the spectrum of literary value. These are two pens used by Lawson, one's in the Gilmore Collection and the other's at the National Library of Australia. The Gilmore pen has H slash Lawson written at the end to identify it, possibly due to the fact that he was a fairly mobile person. The National Library of Australia pen has extensive binding with string indicating that he sought to repair it rather than discarding it. The cost of a new pen may have been too, just too much. One online commentator described this pen as jury-rigged. Um, these pens look unwieldy to us now, given that we don't routinely handle ink. At school in pipe clay, he was often reprimanded for his messy writing, and I think he was a left-hander as well. And with ink pens, there's obviously much more potential for unreadable school books. This uh, envelope, uh, which came came with this pen, which he reserved for signatures. He was very particular about his signature. I think it was a broad nib nibbed pen. Um, the envelope has notes attached, which explain that he liked to use this for his signature. And it was the only one that was found in his room after death, apparently, but I'm not sure if that's true. And this pen from the State Library of New South Wales also shows binding around the top and it's very stained by ink, and it, but it has a fancy stand, which I wonder if, if it was a gift or whether someone provided it afterwards. As the description says, the pen is made from a light brown wood with steel nib affixed to the end by cotton twine. The twine and top of the pen are very blackened. The stand is wooden, H-shaped, 
with two sides that have curved tops and a brace in the centre. It was presented by Joe Noonan in October 1922. This is my last section. I just want to mention the hair, Henry Lawson's hair, which also feels very intimate and personal. In the early 19th century, as you may know, it was common for people to take a lock of hair from the departed as a memento. And it was sometimes turned into mourning jewellery or hair pictures with bejeweled frames and put into all kinds of receptacles and, um, yeah, often framed. Taking hair from authors provided a link with genius, even if they hadn't been personally acquainted. So hair was uh, circulating that you could buy. Um, but I guess the potential for fraudulence was fairly high, as with Jesus's foreskins. The sample of Lawson's hair kept in the State Library of New South Wales is arguably less romantic than these locks of genius's hair that might have been uh, bought and sold, um, belonging to Robbie Burns and others, I believe. Um, and the way it's presented, I find really interesting. Um, it, apparently it was cut off in prison. I don't know if it was before or during or after, but Mary Gilmore says that he didn't have gray hair at this time and the gray hair came later. Um, so he went to Darlinghurst jail because he didn't pay child support. Um, and he, he actually spent several stints in jail, including one of a stay of over 120 days. Um, I think that was in 1905. And he was also admitted to rehabilitation sanatoriums at various times. So this picture shows a fuzzy clump that hasn't been styled or aestheticized like many literary relics. And it does remind me of the tobacco packet in the sense that it hasn't been neatened up. And I think that's quite appropriate um, given Lawson's persona, even though he could be a very snappy dresser at times. All right, to move to my conclusion, um, while looking at all of these items recently, mostly online, it occurred to me that the nature of Lawson's life, his disability, his impoverishment, his addiction, affects the way in which his, his relics have been displayed. Many of the relics are related to his body and his person generally, extending out to his pens and pencils, the tools of his trade. He was not a man who amassed wealth or real estate. For this reason, there's something basic and unadorned about the way that the items connected with him have been handled and displayed. This is not to say that there hasn't been a great deal of care and stewardship involved with the preservation of these items, and they've been kept as a result of social, usually, rather than institutional efforts. Um, and his friends and followers did a lot, uh, and when they passed on, institutions took over. But the fact that they're scattered without one central repository means that they're often not seen together uh, as in author museums, aside from the occasional exhibition, uh, as, as in this one that was at the Australian National Library. And you can see that the watch there, along with the pen, two pens. In my experience, the uh, Lawson Society now focuses primarily on the circulation and performance of his work, rather than focusing so much on relics. Much of this work was done by the previous generation. During my research for this talk, I found an article in The Age entitled Henry Lawson Memorial Society, Gift of Interesting Relic. Gertrude O'Connor, Lawson's sister, attended a meeting of the Henry Lawson Memorial Society of Footscray on the 10th of October 1928 and presented the society with the lamp which was used in his early literary career. Quote, she said there was more in Henry Lawson than even she had imagined, something which gripped the hearts of men. At his funeral, utter strangers came to shake her hand with tears in their eyes. And end of quote. I'm unsure of the location of the lamp now or even of its continued existence. Perhaps somebody knows about that. But it shows that the society handled a number of items relating to Lawson and brokered their assimilation into various collections. 
To return to the it narratives I mentioned earlier, I'm wondering what these objects that I've been showing you might say about their lives if they were allowed to speak to us directly. How would they characterise their former owner? Would his pens complain of overwork and mistreatment and ink staining? Or maybe his walking sticks would be upset about being given away for beer money. His old suit might long for its owner to wear it one more time. It's up to us, the audience, to imagine these narratives when we see Lawson artefacts, whether in a glass case, in a PowerPoint presentation like this one, or through a library website. Thanks. Thank you.